Hi, John Kavakis here. I want to thank you for joining us today. We're going to continue in our series in Luke, God's Love for Everyone, with Luke 14 and a sermon called A Pricey Meal. Now, we'd love to hear from you. There'll be some contact information at the end of the sermon. But meanwhile, let's join the service as it's in progress. Today's sermon is about a meal. And as believers, we're all promised to have a meal in heaven. And John shares his revelation out of Revelation 19, verses 6 through 10. He says, Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah! For the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns! Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. And then I fell down at his feet to worship him. But he said, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Hallelujah. Lord God, I just want to thank you. Bless you, praise you for your word in song, for your word and your spirit that lives in your people, God. And we anoint, if we can anoint, Lord, we bless this time and set it aside to be refreshed in giving and serving and hearing and applying your word. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. I hear it is that day that we uh, celebrate our mothers and uh, so let's keep up a tradition that we do every year. If you have ever had a mother, let's rise in honor of our mothers. Now, this is a 107-year-old tradition that we recognize our mothers on the second Sunday of May. You can go ahead and have a seat. It's a 107-year-old tradition, but you know what? Uh, we all know, if we've read our Bibles, that the idea of honoring our mothers is uh, something that has very ancient roots and is far more than simply a human tradition. Amen? And the fact is that God esteems fatherhood and motherhood to be the most important relationship beyond our relationship with him because it's our first relationship. He's the one and only true giver of life, and our moms and our dads are the way that God chooses to give us that gift of life. So a day like today can be a very joyous occasion. Uh, it is for me, as I remember my mom, she died in 2014. Uh, I have a lot of fond memories of her. But you know what? For some of us, it can also be a difficult day. Uh, because we may realize that our mothers fell short of God's calling upon them, or we have some issues with them, and I have those too with my mom that I've had to work through. But you know what? The Bible never teaches us that our attitude toward our mothers is based upon her performance, does it? Honoring mom is not based on how we feel about them. The Bible teaches us that the foundation of our relationship with our mothers is our relationship to God. And so we see this in the fifth commandment, where God commands us, not suggests, but commands us to honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Now, the preceding four commandments in the Ten Commandments all have to do with our relationship to God. We don't bow before any other gods. We don't worship any idols. We, we don't dare to dishonor his name because to do that uh, means that we are dishonoring his very presence with us. And then, of course, we should remember the Sabbath, this day that we set aside uh, to worship God. And so having laid the foundation for our relationship with him, 
God in the fifth commandment gives us his first instruction about our relationships with each other. And it begins with honor your father and your mother. And by the way, this isn't just a command for young children. This is sort of how we've framed this in our minds because we teach it in Sunday school very proudly and hopefully, don't we? You know, honor your father and your mother. Uh, but this is actually a command for us as adults. This is something that lasts our whole lifetime. And so we can paraphrase the flow of God's commands from loving him to loving each other something like this. From God's perspective, if you truly worship me as the one true God and you love me and you bow before me as the giver of life, then it's only natural that you will do the following things, beginning with honor your father and your mother, since these are the people whom God has chosen to bring us into the world. But you know, what does it mean exactly to honor mom and dad, especially since mom and dad at best are sinners, just like we are? What does this mean? Well, honoring mom means a whole lot more than than just making our bed when she tells us to, although that's certainly a good start. Honoring mom doesn't even depend on how we feel about mom. It depends on whether we love God by obeying the first four commandments. And when we do, We honor our mom and our dad. And so if we're thinking that to honor mom today means that we've got to conjure up sentimental feelings about her, which for some of us may not be possible, or if we're thinking that we need to excuse her sins, then we misunderstand the kind of honor God is commanding us to show her. And likewise, if we think that the bouquet of flowers you have given or are about to give her uh, later on today and, and the sentimental card are all it takes to honor mom, well, then mom would be happy to tell you that's, that's not it either. And we are misunderstanding the kind of honor that God is commanding us to show her. So the basis for honor, well, that's what honor isn't, but here's what it is. The basis for honor is in our worship of God because he's the giver of life. In other words, we give him honor because he truly deserves the right to be honored. And so in turn, what does God do? He gives mom and dad the right to be honored. And that's because he has chosen them to bring us life, and mom and dad are the way that God gives us this gift of life. But what does honor do? What does it do? Because honor isn't just an attitude toward our moms, it's also something that we do, right? It should be visible. So honoring our mother goes far beyond Mother's Day. Every single day of the year, we ought to honor mom. We should should love our moms, even if our love is not the sentimental kind, but the kind of God-honoring sacrificial love that puts God's grace and glory on display. We honor mom by respecting her because of the role that God has given her. We honor mom when we seek hard after God uh, to heal the hurts that may have broken our relationship along the way. We honor mom when we remember that she's only human but divinely called. We honor mom when we lay bitterness and, and, and anger that we might harbor against her, not aside, but at the feet of Jesus Christ our Lord. And we seek to learn how to forgive our mothers and we want her to know and understand the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. We honor mom when we remember to call her and we spend time with her. We honor mom when we cherish her memory. We honor mom when we tell her that we, that, that we love her and we mean it by our actions. We honor mom by taking care of her in old age. We honor mom when we wash the dishes without being asked. We honor mom when we pray for her. We honor mom when we thank her. We honor mom when we ask God to show us why we should be thankful for her. We could go on and on all day with the ways that we could honor our mothers. But the point is, is that when we honor our mothers today in every single day of our lives, It's an act of worship to our creator. And so when we love and honor our great God by the power and presence of the Holy Spirit, we realize that God will make a way every single time for us to honor our mothers no matter who they are. And in fact, what God is telling us in the fifth commandment 
is that we owe it to them. Amen? Amen. Anyway, uh, while you're finding Luke 14, I, I want to tell you about the summer of 1982. Uh, I was working at uh, a, a boat and RV and motorcycle place in Annandale. I was the executive vice president of the entire company. And what that meant was I got an annual salary of about $25,000 and got to use a boat every now and then. Uh, so it, it was a good time. We, we really enjoyed our summers there. Um, but in June of, of that summer, uh, we had an unexpectedly big month, and I got a bonus, and it was $750. I thought I had all the money in the world. I told Kelly, I said, we're going to celebrate. So we called some friends, and we said, we're going to take you to dinner. I got this big bonus, and I found this restaurant down in Roslyn called the Apple of Eve. Now, it's not there anymore, but all I knew about it was it was very highly rated, had all the dollar signs on next to the reviews and so on and so forth. I said, we're going there, and we're going to have a meal. And, and so uh, we wrote everybody down there, and I should have known I was in trouble because when we pulled up, you couldn't park your own car. There's a guy standing there going, Keith, sir, I said, I'll park it. No, I'm sorry, but we'll park it for you. And so the little guy in the uniform took my car away. I thought, okay, well, that's interesting. We go into the dining room. Uh, the table's all set. They're pouring water and so on and so forth. And the guy with the water jug sits over in the corner. And he waits until you take a sip. And he comes over and puts more water in your glass. I thought, wow, this is a classy place. And then they give us the menus. And they have no prices. Like, okay, it's pretty interesting. I don't know, don't worry, everybody. I got this huge bonus. Order whatever you want. Okay? Yeah, we had a great meal. The bill was 750 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it might be the most expensive meal I've ever had, even since then. I don't know ever spending that kind of money just to eat a meal. And the problem was that I didn't check the place out. I had no idea what we were doing. We were walking there. I had this big bonus. We spent it on dinner. And so it makes, you know, the, the question that rises up is, how much are you willing to pay for the things that you want? How much are you willing to pay? So this week's sermon is a pricey meal. Now, last week we were surprised by the kingdom of God. We were surprised by the reality of it, surprised by the residents of it. We were also surprised by the rejects from it. And what we learn from that is we, we need to be careful what we assume. We need to be careful what we assume about the kingdom of God. In particular, who we think is going to be in it and who might not be in it. So this week, now we've got to be, pay close attention to the context here. Uh, because it's, it, the, these, these passages we're going to go through are very frequently taught separately. It's okay, but we're not going to understand the depth of the teaching unless we understand what's going on around this passage. So Jesus is still talking about the kingdom of God. You know, the, we, had, we heard John Clinton in the beginning of the service from Hiroshima uh, praying about the kingdom of God. And here we are, we're talking about the kingdom of God. And so, in, in this passage, he's going to relate some characteristics about the kingdom of God to several meals in the form of several parables. Now, all of the parables will focus in some manner on the power and the presence of Christ and the kingdom of God and how the kingdom of God should manifest itself in the life of a believer. So, we're going to see three perspectives on the kingdom. The first one is the kingdom will be seen. That's in verses 1 through 6. The kingdom will be heard in verses 7 through 24. And we will find out that the kingdom is costly in verse 25 through 35. So let's take a look at the kingdom being seen in verses 1 through 6. So verse 1 starts out with one Sabbath, comma. I love that comma because we're learning as we go through Luke, aren't we? that every time the Sabbath comes in conjunction with Jesus, something interesting is about to happen. And so here we are. One Sabbath, when he went to dine at the house of a ruler of the Pharisees, they were watching him carefully. Now, we don't know who this ruler is. It might be a ruler of the synagogue. It might be somebody that's important in the Sanhedrin. That's not the point here. The important point that we need to realize, and this is an undercurrent in almost everything we've seen in Jesus' interaction with the Pharisees. 
Jesus is fellowshipping with them. He's constantly visiting their house, having a meal with them, sitting in the temple with them. So I think we have a tendency to define the relationship that Jesus has with the Pharisees by the tension that's there. But in reality, Jesus is doing everything he can to talk to them, to draw up next to them, to show them who he is, to show them what the kingdom looks like. He's giving them every opportunity to repent. He's constantly saying, look, here's the kingdom. It's not what you think it is. You know, turn back towards God. You're on the wrong path. So Jesus is fellowshipping with these guys. Meanwhile, they are watching him. If we were to interpret the Greek word for watching here, it would sound something like they were insidiously observing him, which meant that they're constantly looking at him. They're looking at him harder and harder and harder, and they're trying to find some fault. They're trying to form some negative opinion about him. So if, 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 Again, if we understand what, what's happening here, Jesus is reaching out to them. He's trying to save them. He's acting, he keeps calling himself in the presence of the Pharisees a prophet. We know he's more than a prophet, amen? We know that he's the Messiah. But he keeps saying that he's a prophet because they understand the role of a prophet. A prophet is there to warn you, to tell you to turn back. So he keeps on calling himself a prophet. And he keeps on warning them, and they are consistently rejecting him. And verse 2 says, And behold, there was a man before him who had dropsy. Now, I grew up with a real clear definition of dropsy. Every time I dropped something, my aunt would go, he has dropsy. I thought it meant you couldn't hold on to anything. That's not it at all. It's a condition called edema. And it can be very painful. It's an excessive accumulation of fluids, usually in the legs and the feet, sometimes in the hands and the arms. It can be very painful. And at its worst, it can be debilitating. You can, it can be impossible to get around. So Jesus, re- so this guy with the drops, he's there. And Jesus, verse 3, responded to the lawyers and Pharisees, saying he knows what they're thinking. So he says, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? This has been a primary issue for them, hasn't it? So he knows what they're thinking. He's been there before with them. He knows that this may be a trap. He knows that they might have brought this guy in just to see what he was going to do. And in verse 5, the way they respond to him is they just remain silent. They're just sitting there looking at him. And it's a little bit of a challenge. Well, what are you going to do? Then he took him and healed him and sent him away. It's a simple phrase. There's not a lot of discussion about it, who he was, where he went or anything. He just healed him and sent him away. So what we need to see here is trap or not. Jesus heals the guy. And notice what just happened. Jesus put the welfare of the man above the notion that they were probably trying to trap him. So he doesn't stand up indignantly and go, okay, I've had enough of you guys. I object to this. I know what you're doing. He doesn't defend himself. He doesn't complain. He doesn't leave. But he does put the kingdom of God on display. That's what he's talking about, the kingdom. He shows them what the kingdom looks like. They see the healing. Even better than showing them the healing, what he wants them to do is he wants them to think about what they just saw. He wants them to consider it carefully. He wants to think, he wants them to think their theology, think their doctrine through to how they live. Now that's a good lesson for us. Because we can talk a lot about theology and doctrine. It is necessary. Some people say it's not. We, you know, people tell me, oh, I don't believe in doctrine. Well, that's a doctrine. You know, the doctrine that shapes how you meet, how you do church, how you see God. So, so, but Jesus wants the Pharisees to live their doctrine, to live their, thought, their theology, to live an applied theology, not just to understand it, but to walk it through. And he says to him in verse 5, which of you having a son or an ox 
that has fallen into a well on a Sabbath day will not immediately pull him out. And, and kind of what he's saying, I'll give you the Kavakas paraphrase here, is you, you'd violate the Sabbath for one of your animals, wouldn't you? You would violate the Sabbath for one of your kids, wouldn't you? And what he's really saying, and, and we all know people that treat their pets better than they treat their neighbors, amen? He's saying, is that what this is about? Those things that are close to you, you're taking care of. Those things that are not, you could care less about. You're worried about what day it is he gets healed, and you're not even recognizing the fact that he's been healed. We can fall into that trap. We can be so legalistic about the way that we come together, the way that we walk, the way that we talk, that we, we don't recognize God's hand moving through our life. It's what's happening to them. And in verse 6, they could not reply to these things. What do you say? They all know it's true. They see the kingdom with their own eyes. They see it. The question is whether or not the kingdom resides in their hearts. That's always what Jesus is about, isn't it? What's happening in your heart? I know you see the evidence. What's happening inside? Jesus knows that seeing is not always believing. He gets that. So he wants them to believe. He wants them to see and appropriate. He wants it to sink into their hearts and, and impact the way that they live. So he tells a parable. Just so that now that they've seen the kingdom, they can hear about the kingdom. So starting in verse 27, we see the kingdom is heard. And we're going to hear about the kingdom in three news flashes. Now, I wanted to call them news flashes because I like that. It's like, breaking news. This just in. Jesus says, you just saw what the kingdom looked like. Let me explain to you what's happening here. And I'm going to do it in a way that you can understand. I'm going to tell a little story that has a fantastic object lesson. So, verse 7, now I had told a parable to those who were invited when he noticed how cho they chose their places of honor, saying to them, when you're invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in the place of honor, lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by him. And he who invited you both will come up and say to you, give your place to this person. And then you begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you're invited, go and sit in the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you'll be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humble, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Now, there's a simple lesson here. Don't let your pride embarrass you. Don't let it get in the way. Don't make assumptions about what you deserve or what you've earned. Don't assume that you deserve more than you get. Don't take God's mercy for granted. That's the deeper lesson here. Don't elevate yourself. Don't think that you're more important than you actually are. So the first newsflash that we hear about the kingdom is that the residents of the kingdom will exhibit humility. It won't be overcome by pride. Verse 12. He said also to the man who invited him, when you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you to return and you be repaid. Now this has modern applications as well. And basically what Jesus is telling us is that the kingdom is not all about you. The kingdom is not centered on you. It's not all about me. The Bible says that our lives are to be lived for others and about others. So that other people are more important than ourselves. That the things we do, we do for the sake of the gospel, not for our own welfare. And in and, and that we should realize that God didn't sacrifice his son so that we could be happy. He certainly didn't sacrifice his son so that we could be wealthy. And I think we have enough hard evidence around us to know that God didn't sacrifice his son so that we could all be healthy. 
He didn't sacrifice his son though, so that we could go on some odyssey to find ourselves. I get a kick out of that. God's sitting in his room and going, well, there you are right there. What are you looking for? See, we have, we have no rights. We have no privileges. All we deserve is condemnation. Now, I want you to listen to me carefully. Because when I say all we deserve is condemnation, that's a little harsh, but it's okay. We're all in a group. Maybe the person next to me deserves a bit more than I do, I'm sure. I didn't mean to point over there. I'm sorry. <laughs> person next to me. Cat. <laughs> How about this? Oh, you deserve is condemnation. Oh, that sounds offensive. It sounds offensive to some. And I would postulate that to the degree it sounds offensive is a matching degree of a misunderstanding of grace. You see, we, we, we think collectively that sin is something we do to somebody. I've sinned against my wife. And if I go and, and ask her forgiveness, I should be okay. That, that's not how sin works. Sin is against the character and nature of God. It's against everything he stands for. It's against everything we see in the word. The first offense that we commit when we commit a sin is against our Father in heaven. So when, when we think about offending somebody, the first thing we need to figure out is how we have offended God. And the amazing thing is when we start thinking like that, we realize that we offend Him every time we turn around. Because we're constantly trying to make the universe and the world with us in the center of it instead of Him. And so, and we deserve condemnation for that. That's why we're condemned. And the fact of the matter is that we deserve condemnation and what we have received is mercy. We've received mercy. See, God's mercy delivers us from his wrath. It doesn't deliver us into anything. And we see that in the story. The guest that thought he was more important than everybody else, gets to stay at the banquet. That's the host's mercy. In God's mercy, we get to remain alive and here on the face of the earth. That's God's mercy. Now, that should humble us. That should make us grateful. The, the Pharisees are struggling with this because they believe that God's mercy has delivered them into privilege and honor and status. They don't get mercy. They haven't learned the lesson on humility. And as a result, they take God's mercy for granted. He owes it to us. We're his chosen people. Of course he would be merciful to us. Jesus just turns all that thinking upside down. Verse 13. But when you give, when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind. And you'll be blessed because they can't repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. Second new flash we hear about the kingdom is that the residents are selfless. They're not self-centered. They don't do the things they do for themselves. They sacrifice for others. They treat others as more important than themselves. So the Pharisees, the Pharisees are struggling with all this. The kingdom that Jesus is describing is not at all like the kingdom that they think they live in. They think they live in the kingdom of God. It's not true. And Jesus mentions the resurrection just to get their attention, saying, I know what you're thinking. The Pharisees believed that the righteous would be rewarded with the resurrection, but that they would be rewarded in this present life as well. And they believe that the wicked would be detained, detained in an everlasting prison and, and be cursed in his present life. Jesus says, if you're really a member of God's kingdom, your reward is going to come later. It's not going to come now. 
so much for prosperity gospel. So Jesus is saying, humble yourselves. Treat everyone with respect and compassion. It's something that these guys had a hard time doing. After centuries of, of enjoying the esteem of the community around them and the status, they began to take their relationship with God for granted and think it was all about them. No humility, no appreciation for mercy. And the irony of all that is they struggle with this. They have a tendency to withhold mercy. They have a tendency not to be vessels of mercy as they're called to be. And it's why they struggle with the next newsflash about the kingdom, which is grace. Watch this, verse 15. When one of those who reclined at the table with him heard these things, he said to them, Blessed is everyone who will set, eat bread in the kingdom of God. Now, the Jews thought that there was going to be a giant mess messianic banquet. They would sit down with the Messiah and break bread, and that the only people invited to the banquet would be Hebrews. So, Psalms of Solomon, a first century B.C. book, uh, offers a prayer that the Messiah will purge Jerusalem from the Gentiles and will destroy the unlawful nations with the word of his mouth. So anybody who's not Hebrew will be purged from the banquet. Uh, anybody who's not Hebrew will be wiped off of the face of the earth. That's what they thought. And Jesus upsets that line of thinking. In verse 16 he says, but he, sa he said to him, a man once gave a great banquet and invited many. Now, a banquet in a Mideastern village would be a big thing. The whole village would be brought in. Verse 17, And at the time for the banquet, he sent his servant to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. Now, the way this would have worked was he would have invited everybody. Everybody would have dropped by the house at some point and said, Yeah, we'll be there. Uh, preparation would have been made. Food would have been prepared. Uh, a lot of money would have been spent. And it would be an insult and an unnecessary expense not to show up at the banquet when you said you would. So, verse 18, but they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I've bought a field and I must go and see it. Please have me excused. Verse 19, and another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen. I go to examine them. Please have me excused. And another said, I've married a wife and therefore I cannot come. Now, this is a culture of honor and respect. Relationships are important. And the first guy said, oh, I can't go. I got to go look at this field I bought. Except nobody bought a field without looking at it. That was naive. You didn't put money out unless you went and saw the field. Maybe it's filled with rocks. Maybe it's on the side of a hill, whatever. So he's just making up an excuse. The second guy says, oh, I bought some oxen. I got to go check them out. Well, nobody bought an oxen. The way you bought an oxen was you would go see them work. See that they were healthy. Nobody, you know, it's like... I bought a car. I haven't seen it. It will drive tomorrow. I've paid the guy all my money. I have no idea if it runs. I have no idea what shape it's in, but I bought it, and I can't come to your party because i got to look at my car. And the third guy, he just says, I'm not coming. He doesn't even make up an excuse. He's kind of hoping that they have some sympathy with him because he just got married. All this is an insult to the host. And it's a shame to them, people that are supposed to come to the banquet, but don't show up. So how does the host react? Verse 21, so the servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house became angry and said to his servant, go out quickly to the streets and lanes of the city and bring in the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame. Now, what does he say? He said, okay. Those are the people that thought that they should be able to come to the, the, to the banquet. I want you to go bring all the outcasts. Bring all the people that everybody thinks is cursed. Bring them to the banquet. And everyone thinks that they're cursed. Yet here they are. They're receiving this blessing. Verse 22. And the servant said, Sir, what you commanded has been done, and there's still room. And he's saying, You know what? We brought all those people in, and we still got a lot of food left. 
And there's still, there's still more chairs. You know, all those chairs you, you rented from the rental place uh, we've got twice as many chairs as we have people. We've got food. We've got room. And the master said to the servant, verse 23, go out to the highways and hedges and compel people to come in that my house may be filled. Now, let me tell you who's in the highways and the hedges. Those are soldiers. Those are people that are passing through. Those are Gentiles. Now the Jews are listening very closely. Why would anybody bring a Gentile into their house? Verse 24, the host says, For I tell you, none of those men who are invited shall taste my banquet. Whoa. Now the guys with all the excuses are uninvited. And The outcasts, the lame, the people who aren't part of the village receive the grace of the host. The unable, the unknowing, they've done nothing to earn it. Watch this. They're just there. (laughs) Yet they're blessed. They simply receive the grace. So look look at the original invitees here. They they took the host for granted, thought it wasn't important. They made up excuses and did nothing more than show their low regard for the host, actually contempt. The result, no banquet, no grace for them. And the obvious lesson here is that those who have no regard for the host no regard for their Father in Heaven, because that's really who Jesus is talking about here, isn't it? Regardless of where they live, who they are, how they were born, they may receive mercy, see? They may be allowed to live in the village, but they don't receive grace. And in spite of everything that they've done that they thought was good, in spite of everything that they thought was centered upon them, they received no grace. And the problem is the grace is the only way into the kingdom. Grace is the only way into the banquet. So the villagers thought they had reasonable excuses, didn't they? I'm busy that day. I thought I could make it, but I didn't. And all all their excuses did was reveal their hearts. They're self-centered, they're self-consumed, thought they had earned grace and showed that they knew absolutely nothing about grace. So the third newsflash that we hear about the kingdom is that the residents will humbly receive grace. So now we've heard these three things about the kingdom. The residents are going to show humility, they're going to exhibit mercy, and they're going to humbly receive grace instead of assuming that they deserve it. We've seen the kingdom. We've heard about it. Let's look at our third perspective, which is the kingdom is costly. Verse 25. Now, great crowds accompanied him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Let's just stop right there for a second because I was witnessing to somebody a couple years ago. They said, I can never worship a God that wants me to hate my mother and father. That's not what this is talking about. Jesus is talking about being in the kingdom and making him the highest priority. Becomes the most important thing in our life. And and so what he's trying to say is, if you think your father and your mother, in spite of what we just heard, thank you, (laughs) okay, or anything else in your life is more important than Christ, you've got a problem. Christ has to be the highest priority, the fondest goal of your heart. So that, that, that's hard enough, okay? That, that sounds harsh, verse 26. Look at verse 27. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come, af- and come after me cannot be my disciple. Now, we know they don't get it yet, 
But they're going to watch him go down to Via Della Rosa with his cross on his back as all of the skin is flayed off it and he can't barely carry it. He's got to have help with it. So they're going to understand very shortly what bear your cross means. And Jesus is saying, if you're going to be in the kingdom, you're going to have to do likewise. I'm your highest priority and you're going to live the way I live. Oh, man. Then he says this in verse 28. For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, he who has laid a foundation is not able to finish. All who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man ought to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going out to encounter another king in war will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. And that's the bottom line for Christ. You sacrifice everything to be his disciple. It doesn't mean you've got to give everything away. It doesn't mean you can't own anything. What it means is that whatever you have, whether it be in a personal relationship, whether it be in your belongings, whether it be your title, your status, all of that pales in comparison to where Christ is in your life. The kingdom comes with a price. And that price is elevating him to the highest priority in our lives. So verse 34 and 35, he says this. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? Let me tell you something about salt. It never loses its taste. There are things back then in particular that looked like salt, might even taste like salt, but they weren't salt. So what Jesus is really saying, any salt that lost its taste wasn't salt to begin with. It is of no use either for the soil or the manure pile. It is thrown away. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Understand this. Your sacrifice your relationship with Jesus Christ, the priority that he places in your life have to come from deep within your heart. It has to be authentic. And in the final analysis, Christ will decide whether or not it was real. Ah. Stick with me. We just saw three perspectives on the kingdom. We saw Jesus showed us the kingdom in verses 1 through 6. The kingdom can easily be seen with our eyes. It happens around us all the time if we're willing to look at the evidence. But no one becomes a member without the kingdom having an impact on their heart. The true evidence of the kingdom of God is not tangible. It's in the transformation of those who are its citizens. It's in how they change. It's in how they portray themselves to the rest of the world. The rest of the world should be able to see the kingdom in each one of us that call upon him as Lord and Savior. We heard Jesus told us about the kingdom in verse 7 through 24. Kingdom people, people who have experienced this transformation, people who have been changed by grace, have the evidence of that change. And it will be mercy flowing from them, humility flowing from them. Now, I love that. All all that sounds great, doesn't it? I want to be part of that kingdom, don't you? It sounds like a great kingdom. Let me tell you this. The grace to enter that kingdom is free. So this is not a bunch of lessons on how to be a better Christian. So the grace to enter the kingdom is free. But residency comes with a cost. Jesus explained that the kingdom is costly. And it requires us to make him the most important thing in our lives. Now, again, listen to me carefully. Because there's a whole bunch of easy believism being taught out there. 
I read about a church not too long ago that said, you don't have to belong to believe. I, I don't understand what that is. We're talking about the body of Christ. We're talking about people that are sold out for Christ. We're talking about people that live for the sake of the gospel. You have to believe to belong. Now, you can attend, that's fine. You know, you don't have to be a believer to come and sit in these pews. God bless them, the people that come in that aren't. But if you're going to be part of the body of Christ, there has to be some faith in Christ. We have to be willing to, at least at some level inside us, to pursue holiness, to pursue our sanctification, to pursue Christ, to chase after the gospel. I didn't, I didn't count the cost of the dinner at the apple of Eve. If I would have, I might have hesitated. How many of us looking at a menu, look at a $750 meal, won't go, well, wait a minute, maybe, maybe we need to go over to Chick-fil-A. <laughs> Do we ever hesitate at paying the cost of being part of the kingdom of God? How much are you willing to pay? This is not a matter of being thrown out of the kingdom. This is a matter of being able to enjoy everything the kingdom of God has to offer to its fullest. So it's really, what price would you pay for joy, for peace, for contentment, for security, for assurance? You and I can have all that if we're willing to surrender our own self-centeredness. Make our life centered on Christ. That's what they're asking for here. He died to give us access to the kingdom. He died so that we could experience God's grace. And we're invited to an incredible feast. And the price for that peace is, is already paid for. Our entry is assured. You know, the, the dinner at the Apple of Eve was incredibly expensive, but it's nowhere near the price paid for you and me to go to the banquet of, of the wedding. It's an incredible price. Meanwhile, because we're not there yet, meanwhile, I've got to ask myself if I'm willing to pay the price to make him the focus of my life instead of me. Because I can enjoy all of the blessings and the benefits of the kingdom of God right here, right now. That's what Jesus is trying to say in these parables. And that's the question that we have to answer today. Am I willing to pay the price? Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks for your amazing grace. We give you thanks for this incredible teaching on the kingdom. Jesus keeps going deeper and deeper and becomes more and more profound. May we learn the lessons that the people around him are rejecting. Father, may the kingdom be planted deep in our heart, Father. May we be drawn unto you, conformed to your image, Father. Help us, O oh Lord, because we are weak. Our spirit's strong, but our flesh is weak. We need your help, Father, to surrender completely to you. And we ask this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us online. Thank you for being with us in person today. We look forward to seeing you next week. Mm -hmm. Pastor John here again to tell you that we really appreciate your spending some time with us. Love to hear from you. You can email me personally with your prayer requests or comments at kavakas, K-U-V-A-K-A-S, at gmail.com. You can find us on YouTube at WBFVA. We're also on Facebook at Morton Bible Fellowship. And we have a worldwide web site as well, WBFVA.org. I hope today blessed you. I hope you have a blessed week. God bless you. We hope to see you again.